Minister for Defence will answer questions on his behalf. The Leader of the Opposition, questions without notice. My question is to the Acting Prime Minister. The government has kept four-year-old Thanika in detention most of her young life. The Biloela community, I know, has made it clear that they want Thanika's family to come home. Why won't the government let this family go home to Billo? The Acting Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And these matters in relation to immigration are never easy. Are never easy. They are difficult, they are complicated. And indeed, we are providing, and the Minister for Immigration has made a statement this morning uh, to ensure that the support and that the health outcomes for the family uh, will be there in Perth for them. And indeed, uh, we, we will continue to support the family. But I note I note that the opposition leader asked the question, Mr. Speaker. It was not asked. It was not asked by others, and it well could have, Mr. Speaker. It was not asked, indeed, by the member for McMahon, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. No, just just the acting prime minister. If members, the member for Newcastle. No, none of you are going to warm up with interjections. You're not. And if. You've forgotten what happened the last time we, we sat. It shows you really haven't learnt anything. Uh, I'll just say to the Acting Prime Minister, the question from the Leader of the Opposition was uh, very specific, uh, and it didn't ask about alternatives, but I'll, I'll, I'll listen to him. I just caution him in that regard. Mr. Speaker, today the Immigration Minister exercised his power under section 197AB of the Migration Act to make a residence determination to allow the Sri Lankan family currently held in detention to reside in the Perth community. He made this determination. He balanced, Mr. Speaker, the government's ongoing commitment to strong border protection processes. And there is a process that is being worked through. And I appreciate there is still a legal process which is being worked through with this family. But we are providing the humanitarian support. We are providing the necessary health support. We are providing the necessary economic support, Mr Speaker. It is a bit rich, and I will not be lectured to by Labor, who, under their watch, put 8,500 children in detention—8,500 in detention, Mr Speaker, indeed, as part of more than 50,000 who arrived on boats, on 800 boats, Mr Speaker, and I will not take lectures. I was here in the House. I was here when, sadly, those people who tried that risky voyage were dashed up on the rocks and did not survive that. We do not know how many people lost their lives attempting to make that risky voyage. Labor put more beds in detention centres than they ever did the into hospitals, the into the medical will system. His seat. The acting Prime Minister has now strayed from the question. He needs to bring himself back to the question or wind up his answer. The Acting Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Now, in, in making this determination, the Minister for Immigration has balanced all of the things. These, as I say, are very difficult and emotional circumstances, and I do appreciate that. The family will now reside in suburban Perth through a community detention placement, close to schools, close to support services, Mr Speaker, whilst the youngest child receives medical treatment from the nearby Perth Children's Hospital and as the family pursues ongoing legal matters. The member for Mallee has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is for the Acting Prime Minister. Will the Acting Prime Minister inform the House how the Morrison-McCormack government's economic recovery plan is helping to build resilience in regional Australia? The Acting Prime Minister has the call. Well, I thank the uh, member for Mallee for her question, Mr. Speaker, and uh, acknowledge that regional Australia has been the absolute bedrock of the Australian economy yeah, yeah. for decades. Yeah, yeah. And our economy once rode on a sheep's back, but it now rides very much indeed on the back of a thriving resources sector and a much broader agricultural sector. Those sectors are all based in regional Australia. And since the global pandemic outbreak at the start of 2020, our government has provided $311 billion of support to health care, to families, to businesses, many of them small businesses which would not have otherwise survived but for the assistance that we provided. 
indeed also to farmers, to factories, to so many people. So many people, Mr Speaker, who found themselves on the welfare queues through no fault of their own for the very first time. But thankfully, Mr Speaker, there are more people in employment now than there were prior to the pandemic. The unemployment rate is lower now than it was when we came to power in 2013. $311 billion of support through JobKeeper, through JobSeeker, through HomeBuilder, through COVID health care, aviation rescue packages, which has ensured that many of those regional and especially remote communities received the frontline medical personnel, face masks, respiratory devices, all of the things that they would not have otherwise received but for the regional airline network support, domestic aviation network support. This government has been at the forefront of keeping our people safe and keeping the wheels of industry moving and getting things done, getting the job done whilst making sure of the full economic recovery out of COVID-19. And There's still a long, long way to go, and we all acknowledge that. We have seen the economy rebound strongly out of recession and grow to be larger than it was pre-COVID. There are more people, as I say, in a job today, and that is because of the policies that we have put in place, because of the measures we have put in place through the budgets and through, and through what, what we've done exactly to right. support the economy than there were pre-COVID. This government has delivered major infrastructure projects right across Australia, right across the nation. 449 major land transport infrastructure projects have been completed since this government came back into office in 2013. Our $110 billion 10-year pipeline of investment is supporting 100,000 workers. And as I went around regional Australia and metropolitan Australia last week, I saw the benefits of that. High-vis workers, excavators pushing around dirt, asphalt being delivered for the first time and being laid on roads that have never, ever seen. That, uh, that bitumen exercise, and that is what we're getting on with. And they can mock, and they can knock, and they can laugh, but it's happening under the local roads and community infrastructure program right across the nation. The leader of the opposition. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the acting prime minister. The government first announced that it was quote looking at manufacturing facilities end quote for mRNA vaccines in August. 10 months ago. A year and a half into this pandemic, why has the government failed to deliver on its announcement? The Acting Prime Minister has the call. Well, I'll get the Minister for Industry to add to my remarks, but Mr Speaker, we are getting on board with making sure that we've got sovereign manufacturing of, of vaccines. And I tell you what, I would much sooner, much sooner live in Australia than anywhere else in the nation. CSL getting on with the job in Melbourne, Mr Speaker, and I know how much Members work on my left. Uh, the now Home Affairs Minister did when she was in this particular portfolio area. We are getting on with the job of making sure that the vaccinations are not only manufactured here but delivered right across the nation. I'll ask the Minister for Industry to uh, add to my remarks. The Minister for Industry. Word, buddy. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for his question. So it was, I think, 30 years ago that the um, cutting-edge researchers at the University of Wisconsin first experimented on mRNA technology in mice, um, and it took 30 years for the first mRNA technology and vaccines to be put in the arms of human beings in the context of COVID-19. The single first vaccines that have been used on human beings using mRNA technology were used in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic very, very recently. This is absolutely cutting edge technology. The proposition that was contained in the Leader of the Opposition's question, that somehow it would be reasonable to put to the Australian people that it was reasonable and possible that right now Australia would be manufacturing mRNA vaccines is just not a reasonable proposition. The idea that the Minister for Industry might just pause or find a seat. There's a spare one here, I think. Uh, the Leader of the Opposition uh, on a point of order. Yes, Mr Speaker. Far be it for me to interrupt the Minister attacking his predecessor. No, the, no but, I just say to the Leader of the Opposition— The question went to— No, no, no your microphone is off. Just, just hang on. When you rise on a point of order, 
you need to state what the point of order is. We all know what the rules are. Points of order are not a chance to debate the matter. I give enormous tolerance to the leaders of both parties, but you simply need to just. I, that, I want you to appreciate it more, and I'll give you the call now. It's not possible, Mr. Okay, Speaker. Okay, we'll resume your it's seat. It's just not possible. <laughs> you have. The point you have of the call. Come to the point of order. It might help if you, if you state what it is. The point of order is on relevance. The question went to the government's own announcement 10 months ago that it was looking at manufacturing facilities. The Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. The Minister for Industry has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And of course, Australia has got this sort of capability and capacity choosing the right path to realise that capability and capacity is the job of a responsible government to ensure that Australians get the best deal, the most sustainable deal, the deal that provides for a 10-year end-to-end capability that can produce not merely a domestic market that's scalable from zero vaccines to 25 million plus in a short period of time for a cutting-edge technology that is also able to provide scalable production for export markets, that is also able to provide a breadth of goods using this cutting-edge technology, including therapeutics potentially for cancer treatments for which mRNA had its genesis for cardiovascular disease, means that you have to have a thorough, thoughtful process. That process means having submissions for fully costed proposals for end-to-end, -end, onshore, population-scale mRNA capability. It means ensuring the that proposals show time demonstrate— has concluded. The minister's time has concluded. The member for Groom. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer remind the House how the Morrison-McCormack government's steadfast commitment to reducing taxes is creating more jobs for Australians and strengthening our ongoing economic recovery, and is the Treasurer aware of any alternative policies? The Treasurer has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Groom for his question. He acknowledged his extensive experience as an engineer, Mr Speaker, before coming to this place, working on significant infrastructure projects, transport infrastructure, water infrastructure, telecommunications infrastructure. And he stands for lower taxes, Mr Speaker, because more than 60,000 members in the member for Groom's electorate are getting a tax cut because of policies supported by those on this side of the House. And more than 15,000 businesses in the member for Groom's electorate are going to be able to access the immediate expensing. Now, Mr. Speaker, Member for McMahon today, will leave understanding Treasury order 94 have confirmed what yep. we on this side of the House already know, <laughs> is that lower taxes create more jobs, Mr. Speaker. Lower taxes create more jobs. Indeed, the more than $50 billion of tax relief that we announced in last year's budget and this year's budget will help create around 120,000 jobs and drive the unemployment rate up to one percentage point lower, Mr Speaker, as we seek to drive the unemployment rate below 5 per cent, extending the low and middle income tax offset last year and then again this year, extending the immediate expensing and the loss carry back measures. Mr Speaker, these policies are working. Why? Because unemployment is lower, growth is higher and investment over the last two quarters for machinery and equipment is at its highest level in 18 years, Mr Speaker, the highest level in 18 years. And we saw Standard & Poor's just last week reaffirm Australia's AAA credit rating, Mr Speaker. We are one of only nine countries in the world to have a AAA credit rating from the three leading credit rating agencies. And I'm asked, are there any alternative approaches? Well, we know that those opposite stand for higher taxes, Mr. Speaker. $387 billion of higher taxes at the last election. Do you remember the member for McMahon? If you don't like our policies, don't vote for it. Well, guess what? The Australian people didn't vote for it. And now we have the stage three tax cut battle over the other side. The member for Corio, who says we're not going to get in the way of anyone in their tax cut, and then the member for Rankin, who we know he likes to tax a lot, we know he likes to tax a lot, who said that he's talking down our stage three tax cuts. 
This is a stage three cage fight, Mr. Speaker, between the member for Kariah and the member for Rankin. We on this side of the House stand for lower taxes. Those on the other side of the House stand for higher taxes on your superannuation, higher taxes on your housing, higher taxes on your income, higher taxes on your small business, higher taxes on your investment. If you want lower taxes, support the coalition because that's what we've promised and that's what we have delivered. The member for Chifley. Thank, thanks, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Prime Minister. Can the Acting Prime Minister confirm advice from the Industry Department to Senate estimates that it may be up to four years before mRNA manufacturing begins in Australia? The Acting Prime Minister has the call. I'll ask the Industry Minister to answer that question. Mr. <laughs> Members on my left, Leader of the Opposition, the The industry minister has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank the member for the question. So, with the with the approach to market that was um, put out by the government very recently, uh, with an eight-week turnaround for uh, individual consortia to return, obviously timing was an important part of that. The McKinsey's uh, report to government, which uh, preceded that, gave us very good information about what was a reasonable time frame for any of those consortia to put to the government as to what might be a, a reasonable time frame for them to propose that time in which manufacture could actually occur. In some reports, um, media have said, um, based on information that they've received, that a reasonable time frame would be three to six months. Based on all the information that we've received, we think that that is not a reasonable time frame, that it would be significantly longer than that. Um, information that we've received suggests that a reasonable time frame would be more likely to be 12 to 18 months. Four years would be an absolute outside time frame. Uh, the view that I've taken on all the information that's been provided is that is also a very unlikely time frame on the outside, just as three to six months is a very unlikely time frame on the inside, a more likely time frame is 12 to 18 months. Uh, what we have said to those people who might be see, submitting as consortia is if you can submit reasonably that you may be able to do that inside the 12 to 18th time frame, then we will be very interested in looking at the proposition that you would put. But again, the purpose of having an orthodox, orderly, informed process, informed by a very detailed report done by McKinsey, is that when a consortia come to us with propositions about, well, you would race to failure, is what you would do, and you would race to failure without proper information, Members on both sides. and you would race to failure without proper knowledge, and you would race to failure, as you have done in the past, without proper preparation, but that's not something that this government would intend to do. So we have gone into this in an informed way about what we might reasonably expect as a proper time frame, what we might reasonably expect as a proper ask in terms of any assistance that might be provided by government with respect to infrastructure, spending on either a greenfields or brownfield site, or with respect to procurement support and what might be a reasonable time frame. And all of that information has been provided to us in a very detailed way so that we can consider all of the proposals that are put to us, both in the approach to the market and in the direct conversations that we concluded. are having with the member for Warringah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Minister for Home Affairs, will you commit to broadening the definition of immediate family for travel exemptions to include parents and also prospective marriage visa holders? As if this definition remains unchanged and the government does not provide a clear roadmap, we do uh, face the risk of a skills drain. I presented a petition to the House today, and some of the signatories are in the House, and they're awaiting your response. They're desperate for their parents' help, and they need some answers. The Minister for Home Affairs. 
Well, thank you, uh, Speaker, and I do thank the member for her question. And I take on board the very serious issue that she has uh, raised, and there are a couple of parts to it. The first part clearly deals with the definition and whether or not that should be widened, and allow me to come uh, back to that in my answer uh, now. The second deals with skill shortages here in Australia. And can I say that this government takes very seriously both of those issues? Now, in relation to the skill shortages issue, I do understand that the minister responsible is looking very closely at what we can do to address a significant skill shortage in a number of areas here in Australia. And I am very much prepared to work with the minister to make sure that we can do all that we can to ensure that Australia has the skilled workforce that it needs not only now but for the months and the years ahead. In terms of the, uh, the question that you asked in relation to, to broadening the scope and the definition, all I'm able to say at this point in time is that there are a number of investigations that are taking place at this point in time. I would be more than happy to meet with you directly to pursue this further. Thank you very much for your question. The member for Lindsay. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health and Aged Care. Will the minister please outline to the House how the Morrison government is supporting access to new medicines and treatments under Medicare? The Minister for Health and Aged Care. <coughs> thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker, and I uh, want to thank the member for Lindsay. Many One of the uh, very first things uh, which she did after becoming a uh, member of this place was to hold a mental health forum uh, in her electorate, which I was privileged to, uh, privileged to join. And that focus on mental health is included very squarely and fairly in this budget. Uh, in particular, uh, we know that we have increased our total Medicare expenditure uh, by the, uh, the work of the Treasurer and the Prime Minister and the ERC by $6 billion over the course of the forward estimates. From inheriting a, a spend of about $19 billion, Medicare will grow uh, to $30 billion a year, $31, $32 and $33 billion a year over the course of the forward estimates. It also includes $711 million for new Medicare items specifically in this budget, including $288 million particularly for mental health. A focus on uh, severe depression uh, through TMS uh, uh, treatment being made available for the first time uh, under Medicare in Australia uh, will give many Australians with severe depression access to a treatment which will be fundamental, uh, which has been considered and approved as being safe and effective, uh, and that's an enormous step forward. Um, at the same time, we see you know, critical new procedures such as aortic procedures for infants, which were not previously listed. So as the science evolves, the schedule is updated and these new items are brought forward. Wonderful, potentially life-saving procedures which are being included for the first time. At the, at the same time, uh, we've also been able to invest very significantly in new medicines. Now, we know, of course, in 2011 there was a pause to the listing of new medicines. That's not something that's ever happened under us. We are committed to the listing of every medicine which the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee recommends. And this budget, we have done that again. There's $43 billion for new medicines under the uh, PBS and existing medicines as we go forward. Over 2,600 medicines listed to date, and in particular, I am delighted that we've been able to list Engality for chronic migraine. This is a medicine which will make a difference to thousands list. of Australians every year, saving thousands of dollars for those Australians. And so, what we see is an increase of six billion dollars, six billion dollars for uh, Medicare, including, of course, the extension of telehealth, which has now reached. Uh, 60 million telehealth items. Uh, what we also see uh, is the expansion of new treatments for mental health and then the provision of new medicines for migraines. All of these things are making a fundamental difference, and bulk billing has soared to record levels of 88.7 per cent. The Deputy Manager of Opposition Business. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Prime Minister. Can the Acting Prime Minister guarantee that no patient costs will rise as a result of the government's changes to the Medicare benefit schedule on 1 July? No, he can't. The 
Acting Prime Minister has the call. We will ask the Minister for Health to add to the, my remarks. But, Mr. Speaker, we are Medi friends over their, their Medi frauds. Indeed, you just heard from the Minister for Health talking about the amount of bulk billing, really, billing rates, and that certainly is prevalent in regional Australia. The number of telehealth consultations, 60 million telehealth consultations. We are getting on with providing the assistance, the support and indeed the boost in funding to Medicare, as you would expect, and indeed the overall health system. We will always support health. We will always put the record funding into health, whereas those opposite they just run a Twitter campaign and a social media campaign to drag the it down. I'll ask the Minister for Health to add to my remarks. You. Members on both sides. The Minister for Health. Thank you very much. and I'm very pleased to provide uh, the information for the, uh, the member opposite. Medicare investment in new items is going up by $711 million uh, in this budget. Uh, what that means is that we are seeing an increase. There should be no case for any, uh, for any increase for any patients anywhere in Australia in terms of their out-of-pocket costs. And what we've actually seen in terms of out-of-pockets is an increase of 6.7 per cent in the bulk billing rate, which means that we've gone from 82 per cent of patients who paid nothing to visit the GP under Labor to 88.7 per cent under us. A 6.7 per cent increase in the number Member of patients for short, who are we'll paid under standing visit. order 94A. The minister will continue. Yeah, mm. uh, a 6.7 per cent increase in the number of patients who are able to visit the doctor without having to pay. And what that means is that we see an increase in the number of uh, bulk billed procedures, an increase in the number of in the level of bulk billing, and then critically, critically, what we see as part of this. Um, is that uh, there are multiple increases right across the Medicare schedule, new and amended items, increased items, all of these things that are occurring. And what we've done, what we've done is follow the advice of the doctors and the medical expert panels. There is one important difference here, though, between the two sides. When uh, the member for Hindmarsh was uh, the minister in this space, uh, what we saw was a $580 million no, just, no, just cut to, the minister, to mental health the under minister Medicare. Will resume, the minister will resume his seat for a second. No, that was a very specific question. He's been relevant to it up till now, but he wasn't asked about any alternative policies, and there's not an opportunity for commentary in that regard in answer to this question. The minister has the call. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. The minister will resume his seat. The member for MacArthur on a point of order. Uh, my point of order is relevance. It's, it, the minister is not in any way answering the question. Uh, the, mem Cross mini the member will resume his seat. Unfortunate timing on the point of order because I just ruled he'd been relevant up until that point. <laughs> and unless the member, members on both sides, members on both sides. Unless the member for MacArthur found something particularly offensive about the three words the minister got out before he jumped. I led with my chin then. I'll just call the minister. The minister has the call. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. An increase of $711 million in new Medicare items, an increase of $6 billion in Medicare expenditure over the forward estimates. As the Acting Prime Minister said, we are many friends and ultimately they are many frauds. The member for Dawson. Well, has thank the you, call. Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Trade. Will the Minister update the House on the benefits of securing a free trade agreement? With the United Kingdom for Australian industry and jobs. The Minister for Trade. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank the member for Dawson for his question and the way he represents cane growers in his electorate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I know they've spoken to him on many occasions, but since 1974 they haven't been able to get the access for sugar into the UK market that they would have liked. And I thank you, I thank him for his representation on behalf of those cane yeah, yeah. growers in this place. Mr Speaker, 50 years ago, Trade Minister Doug Anthony flew. Yeah, yeah to the UK to oh, attempt great. to maintain some of the special economic relationship Australia enjoyed with the UK. Britain had turned its attention to the common European market, and Australia felt that a special bond was being broken. 
Half a century on, Australia stands ready again to be a willing partner with the UK. We want to help the UK achieve their aim of global Britain, like we want them to make sure that they work with us to promote trade liberalisation, to be advocates for free trade right across the globe. The UK is Australia's fifth largest trading partner, with two-way goods and services valued at $36.6 billion, and the UK is Australia's second largest investment partner. To give you a sense as to what happened in 50 years ago in night and where we stand now, Australia's beef exports are limited to a post-Brexit UK import quota of just 3,761 tonnes at the moment. Australia's sheep meat exporters are limited to an annual UK import quota of just 13,335 tonnes, or 4.3 per cent of UK consumption. Our dairy producers are limited to an import quota that amounts to just 44 grams of cheese per person each year, when the average Briton consumes 125 grams of cheese per week. British consumers are missing out on choosing high-quality, well-priced Australian products. What's more, they are missing out on eating the best lamb chops, yeah, yeah. the best steak in the world, yeah, yeah. and washing it down with the best glass of Australian wine that you could imagine. Since we came to office, we have finalised eight FTAs, and we want to add to that list. Our share of trade covered by FTAs has grown from 26 per cent to 70 per cent, and we want to grow that to 75 per cent. And we will have more to say on this in the coming hours when the Prime Minister of Britain uh, stands up with the Prime Minister of Australia. And I give the call to the member for Karangamo. My question is to the Acting Prime Minister. According to the Sunday Herald Sun, patients could be forced to pay a $1,200 gap fee for a common hip surgery, thanks to this government's changes to the MBS. Can the Acting Prime Minister explain why life-changing surgery will become so much more expensive for Australians in just two weeks' time. The acting prime minister has the call. It's just not true. It is simply not true. Now I will ask the minister for health to address this. But this is what Labor tried in the 2016 election. This is the stunt they pulled. They tried to say to Australians, they tried to strike he fear indeed into the hearts of older Australians that uh, the rug was going to be pulled from under Medicare, from under vulnerable patients. And it is just not true. I would go as far as to say, Mr Speaker, it is a Labor lie. I'll get the Minister the for Health The Acting to... Prime Minister needs to withdraw that. I withdraw. I'll ask the, the Minister, Minister for Health to add for my remarks. Truth is a defence. Thank, uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And, uh, the member is respectfully incorrect. And the reason why is very simple, because the item to which he referred has never been available under Medicare. There are, it has never been available. <laughs> Members on my right. Uh, the, facts, the, the facts of the matter are that hip arthroscopy for FAI has never been allowed or available under Medicare. There were some who wanted it to be available, but it was not done. What we also know uh, is that uh, the Medical Services Advisory Committee has been concerned that do some doctors were inappropriately claiming for items which were not entitled to be done. And that is a very important principle, that we shouldn't have improper claiming. Now, there has been no change uh, to the access to hip arthroscopy because uh, the hip arthroscopy for FAI has not been an available item under Medicare. There are some who wanted it. There are some, sadly, that the Medical Services Advisory Committee of Australia, the independent medical umpire, has identified as having been inappropriately co-claiming. It would be a very small minority, I am certain, but the fact that they have pointed that out and highlighted it has meant that uh, this will mean that these doctors will not 
uh, continue to proceed with what was inappropriately done, inappropriately claimed. And we know that there is strong precedent for this. I see the member for Ballarat. The member for Ballarat, in, a, in an article in the Guardian, Guardian on I think the 16th of April 2015, boasted, <laughs> boasted of saving Members a billion on my left. dollars from Medicare by making changes to Medicare Whoa. items. Uh, in this case, in this case, we have not taken anything away. Uh, it has not existed previously. It, there continues to be clear medical advice from the Medical Services Advisory Committee that that should not change and should not, and there should be no change to current practice. The member for North Sydney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Home Affairs. Will the minister update the House on how the Morrison and McCormack government is keeping Australians safe by taking positive action to combat organised crime gangs and improve security at our airports and seaports? Is the minister aware of any policy standing in the way of keeping Australians safe? Oh, great question. The Minister for Home Affairs. I thank the member for his question, and he knows, as I'm sure that everyone in this place knows, that serious crime is a threat and a major threat to our way of life. Now, it costs Australia more than $47 billion a year. And sadly, the impacts are much greater in terms of the human suffering in our families and in our communities. Now, last week, there was a serious blow delivered to organised crime and criminal gangs in this country through Operation Ironside. Mm -hmm. Now, the Australian Federal Police, working hand in glove with the FBI, were pivotal in bringing down a series of international criminal networks, as well as criminal gangs here in Australia. And the results have been absolutely outstanding. And so far, there have been 268 offenders charged with 627 offences, nearly four tonnes of drugs seized, and just over $51 million in cash confiscated. Now, all Australians should be so proud of the work of the AFP, the Australian yeah. Federal Police. They are a smart, dedicated, committed workforce, and they have worked tirelessly to make our community so much safer. And they said that critical to this operation was the legislation that was passed in 2018. Now, our government is absolutely committed to ensuring that our law enforcement agencies and our national security agencies have the legislative backing that they need, which is why today we have brought on in the Senate our transport security legislation. Now, this bill will disrupt criminal activity at the wharfs and at the airports. Now, most Australians would be very shocked to know that there are more than 220 people working in the most secure areas of our airports and wharves who are on either the national criminal target list or the national gangs list. We want to close the loophole to ensure tighter security checks and eligibility for those in trusted positions in our airports and on our wharves. Now, I ask those opposite to pass the legislation that is needed now, the legislation that we have tried to pass through three successive parliaments. We Members ask on my left. those opposite to pass this legislation to support the work that the coalition is doing to make our wharves and our airports the more secure. There is the no more time that, can, that we can wait. This legislation needs to be passed now, and I do ask those opposite to take a strong interest in national security and to pass that the legislation. The Minister's time has concluded. The Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Prime Minister, and I refer to comments by the New South Wales Premier Gladys Berejiklian in relation to quarantine, when she said, In the future, you can't have a hotel built for tourism as a quarantine facility. When will the Morrison government do its job and create a safe national quarantine system? The Acting Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Mr Speaker, our ability to keep Australians safe is the envy of the world. Yeah. And 
and the quarantine system, which came about as a result of National Cabinet uh, using hotels for quarantining, has worked largely successfully. It has. And, Mr. Speaker, we have indeed placed health as the number one priority as we work through COVID-19. We've also made sure we had the economic outcomes. We've put the money into the budget in successive budgets to build out of a better into a, into a better place out of COVID-19. So we've made sure that we're strengthening the economy, but we're doing it at the same time we're placing at the heart of everything we do the welfare and the health of Australians. And indeed, the federal government stands ready to take any detailed submissions from state governments to build quarantine facilities. But indeed, they, there, will, there will be criteria around such facilities. They will have to be close to an international airport where there are international routes. They will need to be close to a tertiary hospital, such that there are very extremely good uh, medical facilities and, and medical experts there to help any outbreaks. Mr. Speaker. We are making sure that if it comes to uh, quarantining. We've got an MOU uh, with the Victorian government on quarantining. But when you look at the statistics worldwide, the latest figures in the United States, 615,000 deaths, and that is tragic. They have a very good health system in the United States. In the UK, 127,000 people the acting, have acting lost Prime their lives. Minister, he's, he's drifting off what was a very specific question. Uh, he's been relevant up, up until this point, but there's not an opportunity to compare I, and contrast in the regard I, I, of the years internationally. Th thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. But I know I wouldn't. Pr I would prefer uh, to live in Australia than anywhere else, and that is because of the health outcomes that we have put in place, the funding that we have put in place for for vaccinations, no, the funding the, that the we acting have Prime put in Minister. I'm sorry, the question was very specific, relating to a quote from the New South Wales Premier. He's certainly been very relevant to it up until this point. He needs to return to that or wind up his answer. And we have made sure that the Howard Springs facility in the Northern Territory, an additional $500 million to make sure that there are additional beds, additional facilities in that quarantine facility. As I said, we've got a memorandum of understanding with the Victorian government. and We stand ready, whether it's uh, New South Wales or any other state or territory, if they want to work with us, if they want to partner with us uh, to build more quarantine facilities, providing it through the uh, right the right criteria that has been established and through the national cabinet process, happy to work with them. The member for Oxley. Question is to the acting prime minister. There have been 22 COVID outbreaks from hotel quarantine since the start of the pandemic. Why has the government rejected a proposal for a purpose-built quarantine facility in regional Queensland, which would pro provide local jobs and keep Australians safer from coronavirus? Just before I call the acting prime minister, I, I should have alternated and gone to the uh, member. No, 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 no. Hang on, hang on. I've got a better seat than you. Okay. <laughs> and if we want to play that game, it'll it'll play both ways. So what I'm going to do is. We'll go to the question that's been asked and then we'll make it up on the other side. The Acting Prime Minister has the call. Yeah, thank you, Mr Speaker. And, uh, apropos my uh, previous answer, we are happy to work with any state, any territory, to build a proper a quarantine facility, so long as we've got uh, uh, those criteria answered, as well as community support, local community support. But what we're not going to do, what we're not going to do is we're not going to subject regional areas uh, to any potential outbreaks because regional areas have been the safest place in all of the world during this COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, I wouldn't want to live anywhere else other than regional Australia right now because it has proven to be. Uh, leading the economic recovery out of COVID-19 and the safest health-wise in, in all of the world. And so, but we were happy to work with the Queensland government. The uh, member for Ballarat will leave understanding order 94A. The acting prime minister has the call. Members on my right. Happy to work with the Queensland rejecting. government should they decide to bring a detailed proposal that meets the criteria. That meets the criteria. Happy to talk with them. The member for Leichhardt. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Defence. Will the Minister update the House on how the Morrison-McCormack government is working with regional partners to keep Australia safe? The Minister for Defence. <laughs> thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I thank the honourable member for his question. And there's nobody in this place that does more work with uh, PNG and with the 
north of our country across the Torres Strait to keep his community safe and to keep uh, those on those near islands safe as well, Mr Speaker, whatever the threat, whether it's COVID or providing support uh, to those communities. Uh, the work that the member for Leichhardt does is quite remarkable, Mr Speaker. As all Australians will know, uh, the Morrison government is absolutely committed as our first priority to keeping Australians safe, both now and into the decades ahead. But as we do know, Mr Speaker, in the Indo-Pacific region, it is at the moment a far more complex and far less predictable space than at any time since the Second World War. Mr Speaker, it's expected by 2035 that at least half of the world's most advanced combat aircraft will be operating in the region. And we know, Mr Speaker, that more than half of the world's 470 in-service submarines are already operating in the Indo-Pacific waters. Mr Speaker, the government is stepping up our engagement with our Pacific partners and working even more closely with our allies. As the Prime Minister has demonstrated through his leadership in Cornwall yeah, yeah. over recent days, he is engaging, and rightly so, uh, with President Biden, with Prime Minister Johnson, with others at the G7, to get a sharper focus on what is taking place in the Indo-Pacific. And Mr Speaker, the Foreign Minister and I met with our Japanese uh, counterparts and also with our German counterparts in the 2 plus 2 dialogue uh, over the last few days. And again, a very sharp focus, Mr Speaker, on what is happening in our region. I know the French, the Germans, NATO and others are having a particular look at, Mr Speaker, in a different way, perhaps, than they did even 12 or 18 months ago, uh, what is happening in the Indo-Pacific region. And we are very grateful for their engagement. We will continue to work very closely with them, Mr Speaker. Uh, it follows on from a record investment that we have made into our capacity for the Australian Defence Force a $270 billion investment over the course of this decade to provide them with the support, the equipment that they need to make sure that they can keep our country safe, Mr Speaker. We shouldn't take for granted what we have, and we do know that with our partners, in particular with uh, the United States, the United Kingdom, with Japan, with India in the Quad, the work that we do with our ASEAN partners uh, and the work that the Prime Minister has done with the G7+, Plus, give us the best opportunity to make sure that we stand up for our sovereignty, to make sure that we reject any attempt uh, at interference in our country or in that of our near neighbours, and we will make sure that we do whatever it takes, Mr Speaker, to keep Australians safe. The member for Reid. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Communications, Urban Infrastructure, Cities and the Arts. Will the minister please update the House on how the morrison McCormack government's online safety bill will deliver on our commitment to keep Australians safe online? The Minister for Communications. Well, I do thank the member for Reid, who, as a extremely well qualified and experienced academic and clinical psychologist, has a very good understanding about the importance of online safety and the way that online abuse can be very damaging to mental health, Mr Speaker. And this is an area where our government has had a very clear focus since coming to government in 2013. In 2015, we created what was then called the Children's eSafety Commission, and that was a world first, a scheme to remove cyberbullying material directed at children. In 2017, we expanded the remit, the, renamed the eSafety Commissioner, and introduced a scheme uh, to assist victims of the unauthorised sharing of uh, intimate images. And again, Mr. Speaker, uh, enormously damaging to victims of that, overwhelmingly women. In 2019, uh, we gave the eSafety Commissioner additional powers to deal with abhorrent violent material following the appalling live streaming of the murder of more than 50 people in the dreadful Christchurch mosque attack. And Mr Speaker, we are continuing. We took to the 2019 election a commitment that we would introduce a new online safety act to build on and strengthen those existing safeguards. And that legislation is now before the other place. And it includes a new adult cyber abuse takedown scheme. It includes stronger measures to deal with the uh, cyber bullying of children. There's a set of basic online safety expectations where we are saying, on behalf of the Australian people, to online platforms, this is what we expect of you. 
uh, there is a reduction in the takedown period from 48 hours to 24 hours. There will be mandatory transparency reporting on how platforms are addressing online harms. Because, Mr. Speaker, Australians spend an enormous amount of time online, but you have the same right to be protected by the rule of law when you're in the digital town square as when you're in the physical town square. That's why we established the Online Safety Commissioner. That's why we're giving the, the eSafety Commissioner stronger powers uh, through this new uh, online safety bill now before the other place, and why we're also backing it with backing the eSafety Commissioner with record funding of over $120 million uh, over the next four years, including nearly $40 million to deliver on the new protections that are set out in the new Online Safety Act. Mr Speaker, uh, the internet is a wonderful resource, uh, educationally, socially, economically, but it also contains dangers, and we are determined to make sure that Australians have practical tools that they can have recourse to. That's what the eSafety Commissioner has been effectively doing over her years of operation, and under this new legislation, we are building on and expanding her powers to keep Australians the safe Minister's online. The time has concluded. The member for Lilly. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Prime Minister. Can the Acting Prime Minister confirm evidence from Senate estimates? The Department of Health has not even been asked to provide advice about a fit-for-purpose quarantine facility in Toowoomba. The acting prime minister, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we are happy, as I said, uh, member for Lilly, we are happy to take a detailed submission on any quarantine facility, uh, but they need to be a detailed submission. They need to, they need to address Commonwealth key assessment criteria for such a quarantining facility. A quarantining facility. Uh, I have to say, would complement uh, what we are doing as far as the hotel quarantining system, which has been critical to managing the potential spread of COVID-19. And that system has been 99.9 per cent successful at preventing the spread of COVID-19 into the community. And you can yell all you like, but that is the truth—99.9 per cent. Other countries elsewhere would love to have that statistic over their quarantining, over their ability to reduce and minimise COVID-19. Now, on the 4th of June, on the 4th of June, the Commonwealth's key assessment criteria for investment in purpose-built quarantining facilities was released, and the Commonwealth uh, is using these criteria to assess any proposals, be they from Queensland, your state, Member for Lilly, or any others, for purpose-built quarantine facilities uh, provided by state and territory governments seeking federal support, seeking the support of the Commonwealth. Key considerations include, and these are important, that a proposal should represent value for money. Now, I know when Labor was in power there were a lot of infrastructure built that wasn't value for money. But when we do something, and when we do it, Members it is, there is left. value for money. The Acting oh, Prime Minister will resume his cease. The Manager of Opposition Business on a point of order. On direct relevance, the Acting Prime Minister can't talk about the Leppington Triangle the in this answer. He wants to talk about value for money. The Manager of Opposition Business will resume his seat. And the Acting Prime Minister has the call, but he needs to be relevant to the question. Touchy, touchy. Uh, provide net additional quarantining or? capacity <laughs> and work alongside alongside hotel quarantine, meet the health requirements and be for a national facility for use by all Australians. Now, further criteria include proximity to an international airport taking regularly, regularly scheduled international commercial passenger flights and close within approximately an hour's vehicle transport, because this is important, to a tertiary hospital, otherwise known as a principal referral hospital. States and territories need to identify the most appropriate potential sites for quarantine capacity, reflecting their experience and the practicalities of an effective quarantine system which needs to bring together health care logistics and law enforcement aspects to minimise risks. And that's what we all want. We want to minimise risks. We want to continue what we have done, and that is keeping the case rates low, keeping the death toll uh, as where it is now, 910. We do not want any more deaths, and we mourn for those Australians who have lost their lives and their families who are left behind. 
But I thank again on behalf of the government, on behalf of a grateful nation, to all of those Australians who have done the right thing during COVID-19, who have worn masks when asked to do so by premiers in far-off capitals when they were a long, long way from any COVID cases. I thank Australians for what they have done to keep their communities safe. The member for Flynn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Services Management Minister. Will the minister please outline how the Morrison McCormick government Ag 2030 plan is supporting the agricultural industry and provides the framework for industry to reach record high levels of agricultural production? Well done. The Minister for Agriculture. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank the member for Flynn for his question and acknowledge the region that he represents as an agricultural powerhouse in Queensland that is contributing to the stellar recovery of agriculture, here, here. one in which ABARES has now finalised for this financial year will be $66.3 billion, up from $60 billion estimated at the start of this financial year. And that is because this government, Reducing. not only in this budget but the budget before, has put cold hard cash behind agriculture to ensure that it continues to grow. And that's why, as part of putting that cold hard cash, we've announced our Ag 2030 plan of seven pillars. The first one around trade, and one in which ABARES now has finalised that this year record exports of $47 billion and are estimating now for next year a growth to $50 billion. And that's because we have put more agricultural councils on the ground in embassies and high commissions, getting market access commodity by commodity, but also digitising our platforms, making sure it's easier for our exporters to be able to send their product around the world, streamlining the process, the application process, and ensuring, ensuring that our product is competitive and, is speed, and there is speed to market. We're also supporting and making sure we're protecting brand Australia, particularly through biosecurity. Bio in a further $400 million we announced in this year's budget on top of the $888 million committed in the October budget, ensuring we're looking at not just putting boots in the ground and paws in the ground, but also new technology, 3D X-ray technology that is world, world leading and will in fact have been taken up by other countries in the world that will streamline and improve our capacity to be able to scan even more products as they come through our borders to protect our our brand Australia. We're also looking at the stewardship of land, whether that be through measuring soil carbon or biodiversity to ensure that everyone around the world knows the stewardship of our land and the way that our farmers have done it. Or it's the infrastructure, the three and a half billion dollars extra money put out to build more dams and to plumb this nation. We are prepared to work with the states to go and do this. We are going to cut the cheque and let them dig the holes. That's the constitutional ability of our states, and that's what they can do because we are committing $3.5 billion. Or it's the next pillar around the modern manufacturing platforms that we're putting $1.3 billion into making sure that we can go further through the supply chain or even looking and, and addressing the vulnerabilities in our supply chain. It's also importantly around our innovation systems, making sure that our farmers have the technology and science of the 21st century that allow them to be able to continue to produce the best food and fibre in the world. And finally, it's about our people, reducing right. university courses by 59 per cent in agricultural here, here. courses and it, that have seen an increase in enrolments by 120 per cent. So this government is putting an environment in Australian agriculture to reach its goal of $100 billion. The member question. for Rankin. Once. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Prime Minister. The government has continued to spend taxpayer money on advertising its so-called comeback, even as it failed to meet its vaccine rollout targets. How much taxpayer money has been spent spruiking the Prime Minister's slogans compared to public health communications encouraging Australians to get vaccinated? The Acting Prime Minister has the call. It's always important that a government, be it our side or be it when they were in power, those six sorry, dysfunctional, chaotic years to ensure that important public information messages Members get out on there. my rights. Members on my rights. And that is why we have a very transparent, very transparent advertising system by which we advertise such things as the vaccination rollout. To advertise such things as the availability, working in conjunction and collaboration and cooperation with states and territories to ensure just that. We want Australians to get vaccinated. There's no more important task for Australians at the moment to get that jab and then to get that second vaccination. 
And indeed, we are making sure that any advertising is always transparent, it's always made public, the information there, but it's important information that the federal government gets out to advise Australians accordingly what they could and should be doing on behalf of their communities and their nation. The member for Higgins. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction. Will the Minister please update the House on how the Morrison-McCormack government is working with our international partners to accelerate the development of the technologies we need to reduce emissions here and around the world? And is the Minister aware of any alternatives to this approach? The Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the mem member for Higgins for her question. And as a, uh, a scientist, she knows the power of technology to solve hard problems, including how we bring down emissions whilst maintaining affordable, reliable energy and creating jobs in a strong economy. Mr. Speaker. And she knows that technology is the key, key to that. She also knows that that's all about bringing those uh, clean technologies to cost parity with their higher emitting alternatives. Then they will be adopted, not just in Australia, but around the world. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and we're doing our bit. We've seen the lowest emissions in Australia since 1990, 20 per cent down oh, well on done. our 2005 yeah. levels, Mr Speaker. And our technology investment roadmap is key to floor. continuing to see that extraordinary performance. Over the next decade, we'll see $80 billion of investment in clean yeah, yeah. technologies, 160,000 like new jobs. Working. Mr. Speaker, and we're working with international partners to get the most out of these technologies. And those, those initiatives include partnerships that were signed over the weekend with Singapore, with Germany, and with Japan. Mr. Speaker, one of our biggest energy customers, all part of a $565 million package to work with international partners to develop and deploy those technologies. And, and that initiative alone will create 2,500 Australian projects, Mr Speaker, but I am asked about alternatives. Mm. And the alternative is Labor, Mr Speaker. In fact, so opposed is Labor to this technology-led approach that they are opposing $192 million of investment in ARENA. $192 million of investment in ARENA. They're opposing 1,400 jobs. And that includes, Mr Speaker, $71 million for electric vehicle and hydrogen charging uh, infrastructure, $52 million for microgrids in regional Australia. They're opposing $20 million for heavy vehicle clean technologies and efficiencies, Mr. Speaker, and $47 million for energy efficiency in heavy industry, Mr. Speaker. Uh, those, those opposite are voting against EV charging infrastructure. They're voting against more competitive industry and transport in Australia, Mr Speaker, uh, and they are voting against carbon capture technologies that are supported by the IEA, by the IEA and the IPCC as essential to reaching net zero, Mr Speaker. Now that the member for Hunter has put it succinctly and well. He said it's nothing short of genius heroically voting against carbon reduction initiatives that Labor actually supports. Nothing short of genius, Mr Speaker. Members opposite have no plans, no policies and no idea. The Acting Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper.